I believe that the first prayer of an unsaved person that's heard is the prayer of salvation or that prayer of repentance when they trust Christ as their Savior. The second reason that I believe Cornelius was a saved man is by the description that his servants give of him in verse number 22. Now, if you disagree, this isn't the message. I just want to get this out of the way because I, what you want to believe, I don't mind. I just believe that there are four reasons here why he was saved. Verse number 22. And they said, these are the servants that were sent to go get Peter. And they said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man. That word just, and I have it here and I've printed it out. That word just comes from the Greek word having to do with righteous, one who's declared guiltless, faultless, or innocent. That is the same word just that we find in the description, I believe it's Hebrews, where he delivered just Lot. Well, we know he didn't deliver just Lot. It was Lot and his daughters and, and his wife. That word just means justified Lot. I believe that they are saying here he's a righteous man, a declared righteous man in that description. The third thing that I find in this passage of Scripture, why I believe Cornelius, this is Bible study here, why I believe Cornelius was a saved man, because never did the Holy Spirit endue anyone who had not yet believed. The endowment of the Spirit means to clothe or to put upon or to place upon. And we see in Acts, and we'll see it in the message, so I won't go there right now, but we see in Acts chapter 8 where the, the disciples or the apostles are sent and they confirm the believers. And once they confirm the believers that are already saved in Jerusalem, then the Holy Ghost endues them. He comes down upon them and he fills them as we find. And it is that endowment that is taking place here in verse 44, uh, 44, 45, and 46. We know that because of verse 46, for they heard these, this group that came with uh, Peter, uh, sorry, with Peter to the Gentiles, uh, to this man's house, they heard them, that's the Gentiles, speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, can any man forbid water? And we go into baptism. And we find the endowment of the Spirit of God. It was not the initial salvation experience. Because the initial salvation experience would not have yielded tongues. We don't find that. That's out of context. That's out of the biblical pattern of Acts. And so I believe that, number four, why I believe Cornelius was a saved man, is there is no conversion experience recorded, and God never would miss the main part. God would not miss that in this story. He covers so much, and I believe it starts with Cornelius being a saved man. I say that to take, give some of you reason to study and just go look a little bit. But as I have read this story, I find Cornelius is a key figure, as we all agree, in the spreading of the gospel to the Gentile world. And we look here in verse number 25 of chapter 10. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him. And fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter took him up saying, stand up. I myself also am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many that were come together. I want to preach to you this evening a message entitled, I myself also am a man. I, am, I myself also am a man. I'm better than nobody. Cornelius, don't bow to me, Peter said. I'm a man just like you. I have to believe on Christ just like you. And may we never get this mindset that because I'm saved, I'm better. My destination's different, but my condition's still the same. I'm a sinner. But thank God I'm now a sinner saved by the grace of an almighty God. Let's pray and Miss Emily, you come and sing for us. Father, I beg you to fill me with your power tonight as we go to Acts chapter 10. And Lord, as we look into the scriptures, I pray that you would motivate us and stir us and convict us to do more for the cause of Christ. And Lord, I thank you so very much, as I have already throughout the day, for this first day of 2012. May we take it seriously. May we understand as we meet on the Lord's day that you want us to do more for the cause of Christ in 2012 than we did in 2011. So may we advance and may we serve and be good soldiers of the cross of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated.
much. Thank you, thank you. Great music today. Acts chapter 10, let's go to verse number 1. In Acts chapter 10, verse number 1, there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always or always. He saw in a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming in uh, to him and saying to him, Cornelius, and when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? And he said unto him, thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. I'd like to start off by saying, may we never forget that we are not better than anyone just because we're saved. Our salvation does, it does put us, or it does not put us on a plateau, but rather it places a heavier burden upon our shoulders. We talked about that briefly this morning. Salvation makes us a bearer of the truth. And it is our responsibility to tell others of their fate without Christ. As a matter of fact, we ought to feel very low if we have not properly shared the gospel with another. And if we have never watched them trust Christ. Because our responsibility ought to be sobering. We ought not take salvation carelessly. We ought not just take it as, well, this happened to me, and if it doesn't happen to anybody else, I don't care. And you'd sit here and say, I'd never say that, but you say that by your actions. If you have never told somebody else about the saving grace of our Savior, we are not bearing one another's burdens properly. For one of the burdens that we are to bear is that burden that they're unsaved, and I can help them with that. I can't save them, but I can point them in a different direction than where they're headed now. And we look, and sometimes I believe that it would be pride and it would be arrogance why we don't ever knock on a door to tell somebody about Christ. I believe that the devil gets in and he completely twists our priority and our list of priorities. And that's why you'll be too busy to go out on a Tuesday or Thursday or even a Saturday. Even if it's just, it will come out for our Super Saturday soul meeting that we're going to have once a month. But the devil twists our priorities. And everything else is more important. And may I say that my greatest prayer and desire is that my children will all be in heaven with me. And right now, I, my wife is saved and my, my uh, older daughter or my two daughters are saved. But I'm praying for my three-year-old son to be saved. Amen. Now, if, he, if the Lord were to come right now, I personally believe that my son is before the age of accountability and that God would take the innocent out of the world. I, I believe that. Now, there's some that, that say, well, that's not in the Bible. And, and okay, I'm not here to debate with you. I just read the Bible and see how precious the children of God are to him. And, but I also see how precious children are to him. And he said, suffer little children to come unto me. Then he rebuked people. And he said, if, if any one of you were to hurt one of these little ones, it'd be better that a millstone be wrapped around your neck and you dropped into the deepest of seas. So some would say, well, nowhere in the Bible does it say that infants will be raptured. Then I would say, if it doesn't say it, then let's go to the personality of Christ. Let's look at his personality briefly. I don't see God leaving an infant in a crib unattended because his parents and family were raptured out. And for day after day after day after day after day, uh, the nutrition begins to, to dwindle and he becomes malnourished and, and he becomes uh, petrified because he's left alone. I don't see uh, God going against his own word by saying, don't hurt them. And I believe that'd be hurt. So when we look here, we find as, as we come into this thing of salvation, salvation's important because the Lord's coming soon. And if we really believe that the Lord is coming soon, then why do we not tell more people about him? Would fear really grip you from trying to rescue a soul from a fire uh, that might be uh, next door to your house? So I was just too afraid. Now some would. And let me help you. That, that person who was too afraid to go in and rescue a screaming child from the middle of that flame would forever live with the horror and regret that they didn't do enough if that child lost their life. 
And there are some that will live with the horror and regret as people you and I know die and find eternity in a place called hell because we didn't do enough. Let's do our part for the cause of Christ. We find, number one, the prayer of Cornelius was heard. The prayer of Cornelius was heard. This Gentile leader of the Italian band was a man of prayer and a man of fear toward God, the Bible shows. The will of the Son was that all mankind would hear and accept the wonderful news that the Messiah's death, burial, and bodily resurrection is what could save everyone from their sin. Up to this point, the gospel had yet to really spread. Oh, the Lord had taken it to the Samaritans, which were a people of mixed race. But to send a disciple or an apostle to the Gentile world had really yet to be done until this day. We will find as we look at the story that it was against the Jewish law for Peter to go. But may I say prayer worked. Prayer worked. And I believe that there are certain people within our community who every night they don't know our Savior. They may believe in God. And as they pillow their head at night, they begin to say, God, would you help me? God, would you help me? God, would you help me? And I believe that's the beginning stages of that repentant prayer. They're looking for something that will change their life. And guess what? So God raises up a church. Amen. And God hears that prayer of repentance. God hears that longing of somebody who wastes their money and wastes their life by washing their miseries away in the bar or uh, on the streets as they buy their drugs or as they're popping their pain pills, trying to get just some of the pain away. And our job is to go. This Calvinistic idea that, well, if you're going to get saved, you'll just get saved is a lie of the devil. And it's a way that the devil keeps us from doing our part. I'm glad I had a mama that told me how to go to heaven. Because I don't know that I would have found him on my own. I'm glad that I grew up in a church that preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because I don't know that I would have found him on my own. I thank God that I had Sunday school teachers and, and, and a youth pastor who, who loved God enough to preach it hot and heavy. And point us down the right road and say, hey, you need do you know the pastor of my youth is no longer a pastor today but has lost his family? Do you know the youth pastor of my teenage years is no longer standing and preaching the Word of God, no longer has the beliefs that we hold so dear? But they were there just long enough to tell me about Christ. My mom and dad are still standing strong. There's still pillars that I lean on. There's still counselors from which I seek godly counsel. But may I say this man, Cornelius, his prayer was heard. And God can hear some of your prayers, saved people. Yes. But we need to stop praying so selfishly. And we need to start praying selflessly and start begging God to save some of your family. Start begging God to save some of your friends. Don't let the devil have them without a fight. Some of you got kids in their 40s or 50s who say, well, mom and dad, you have your way and I have mine. Pray them to Christ. There ought not ever be a service that you don't come to this altar and beg God to bring them to Christ. There ought never be a day when you do not bend your knee by your bedside and beg That's our responsibility. Right. Our prayer can be heard. We could go through our prayers are heard all the time. Sometimes God's answer is no. But it is God's desire that all men come to repentance, the Bible says. God's not willing that any should perish, that all should come to repentance. And he chose to use us as his arms to reach out and draw all men to him. We find not only the prayer of, the, of Cornelius was heard, but number two, the person selected to go to that Gentile man was Peter. Look at verses 9 through 18. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and would have eaten, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened and a certain vessel descending unto him. 
as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, verse 14, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. This was done thrice, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. Now while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry uh, for Simon's house and stood before the gate, and called and asked whether Simon which was surnamed Peter, were lodged there. Cornelius has been told in these first several verses that prayer has been heard. He's also told by this angel, he said, now I want you to send some uh, men to go and fetch Peter. Well, these, Gentile, these men who serve this Gentile uh, 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 military leader, they go and they find Peter, a Jewish man, an apostle of Christ. Peter is told of God that he's going to have to do some things that are against his culture, that are against his upbringing, and we find the person selected to go was Peter. You see, Peter was that outspoken preacher of the chosen 12. And Peter tries to remind the Lord in verse 14 that this was against Jewish custom. It's against the law. Yet when God says go, may I remind us we are to go. When God says go to Africa, we go to Africa. When God says go to Baltimore, go to Dundalk, we go to Dundalk. We all come to Dundalk for church. I just think that's a great thing. People say, Pastor, what do you think of Dundalk? And I want to look at you tonight, those of you that might not live in Dundalk, and say, what do you think of Dundalk? Ain't it great we get to go to church in Dundalk? Yes, because when God says go, you know what? We go. And every person here is chosen. Peter was the only one that God wanted to go and be the disciple of this, to this powerful Italian man. This, this was about to start something that God could foresee, but Peter could not. Do you understand that you never know, but the person that you lead to Christ could heal just hundreds, if not thousands of people who, as we said this morning, could become citizens of heaven. I remember the day that the Kessels came to Calvary Baptist Church. I remember that night in the back of our auditorium where I got to lead Molly to Christ. Tony had trusted Christ earlier as a young boy raised in a, in a, in a boy's home. We have no idea what God's going to do in Africa, but can I tell you, God's going to do everything, or the devil's going to do everything possible to derail you. Don't let him. The devil does everything possible to derail us all from the purpose for which God has called us. And God has called every one of us. If you live on a street, you ought to claim that street for Christ. That's your street. Your neighbors ought to hear about Christ. Your neighbors ought to know that you're saved. Your neighbors ought to know how to be saved because you live on that street. And you could tell them, hey, I'm glad you live on our street. If a new person moves in, go meet them. We have a couple homes on our street. People are continuing. It's like a revolving door. And you know what? We meet them all every time. I've led many to Christ under the light post right outside of our home after that big, uh, uh, under that phone pole. And we get talking about the Lord. And you know, uh, they, 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 a lot of them come to visit. They don't all stay. But I want to do my part on my street. Why? I may be the person that's been selected to go to whoever live on that street. The phrase in verse 20 that I'd like to point out to you, doubting nothing, would you look, arise therefore and get thee down, verse 20, and go with them, doubting nothing. It's the Lord talking to Peter. Verse 19, while Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, behold, three men seek thee. Arise therefore and get thee down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. That doubting nothing, I believe, never worry about, will I know what to say? So many times people say, well, I, I, I just, I can't go so and I don't know what, I, what I'd say. Just go and obey God, doubting nothing. Just go and figure out that your obedience will be recognized by God and he'll do something with a willing vessel. He'll do somebody who just surrenders to his will and to his desires and to his way. 
We find not only the prayer of Cornelius was heard, the person selected was Peter, but we find the propagation of the gospel begins to everyone. In verses 28 through 35, it says, And he said unto them, he, Peter has now come, we've read that earlier, and he said unto them, Ye know how that it is unlaw an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. But God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Therefore came I unto you without gainsaying, as soon as I was sent for, I asked therefore for what intent ye have sent for me. And Cornelius said, Four days ago I was fasting until this hour. And at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing. And said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard, and thine alms uh, are had in remembrance in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa, and call hither Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodged in the house of one Simon a tanner by the seaside, who when he cometh shall speak unto thee. Immediately therefore I sent to thee, and thou hast well done that thou art come. Now therefore are we all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. May I say that I believe that God has set us in such a diverse area. We have people just about from every nation under heaven that come right here to Baltimore. We've got every color. We've got every, we, we just got every kind of people. You'll never be able to fulfill the calling that God has on every believer's life if you're a racist. You'll never be able to fulfill the calling that God has on your life if you can't get the color of somebody's skin out of your mind and realize that everybody has a soul and that soul is either going up or it's going down. Maybe that's why God brought a California boy to pastor this church here in Dundalk, Maryland. Because I didn't come with any prejudice. I didn't come with any racial bones in my body. I, uh, that, 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 that rubs me the wrong way. California is what they call the melting pot of America, and America is called the melting pot of the world. People from every nation, they come to America. People from every nation come to California, and we're watching as that happens right here in the Baltimore area. I have never looked at an Indian man at a, uh, uh, or a Hindu man or a Muslim man uh, at a gas station and looked at them as though they're a terrorist. But I've heard some who've said that. Not all here. I hear it sometimes even at the gas station. Now it fires me up, and some of us have talked about when they got this, this little mosque thing going on that they call a community center where they gather uh, faithfully to pray. And my, my greatest desire is that place never outgrows a Baptist church that God's also placed in Dundalk. This is our town, and if you won't claim it, I will. This is my town. And when I drive by there, I pray all the time that God will shut it down somehow. I don't pray any hurt on all those people, but I pray that they don't get it in their mind to hurt us. But you know what? Some of them can be saved. Some of them go because that's all they know. But every once in a while, some of us need to just not look at the skin color and look into the heart and say, Lord, would you give me words to say? Brother Larry Hale, who stood up here today, has Jewish blood flowing through his veins. And I thank God for that because God uses that to reach out. I thank God for the Sassers who are, are going to the large Jewish population of the Baltimore area. I thank God for that. Amen. I thank God that we've got black folks that come to our church and white folks that come to our church and brown folks that come to our church and, 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 and we've, got, we've got all kinds, but we, we got yellow folks and green folks and some of your blue folks. All different kinds. Some of you always walk around so mad, you're red, <laughs> burgundy. But we find the propagation of the gospel begins to everyone. That word propagate means to spread from person to person, to cause to increase in number or an amount. 
You see, God was going to use Peter to make sure that this powerful man had the right belief system. And as he comes to Cornelius and he talks to Cornelius, I believe this powerful centurion who was over so much, God is going to use him to take a stand for Christ. He's recorded in the book of God. God's not willing that any should perish. Matter of fact, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And isn't it something that Peter realizes now of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. He didn't grasp this when Jesus talked to the woman at the well. It took this for him to realize that God's no respecter of persons. We must understand that we have to do our part. We find lastly tonight in verse 44 through 46, while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them, which heard the word, and they of the, and they of the circumcision, that's the Jewish uh, uh, folks that had just come with Peter. Peter leaves, and he comes, and he brings some folks with him, and, uh, and they of the circumcision, which believed they had already been saved, were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him uh, ter uh, to tarry certain days. Now, I understand that some could say, boy, they, they got saved right there. And I don't care if you want to believe that. The fact is they're saved. That's what matters in this story. They didn't know what to do with their salvation. So God says, I'm going to send you over. I'm going to send you to this centurion. I'm going to send you to Cornelius. And I need you to talk to him. And we find that as Peter talks and as he is speaking to them the wonderful words of Jesus the Messiah who Peter got to walk beside, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost comes down upon them and the tongues, don't, don't get your, let your mind go wild. I believe that, that these Gentiles began to speak the Hebrew tongue that these uh, with Peter would speak. I believe that they began to hear and just something transpires that is just powerful that only God can do. And we find number four, the pouring of the Holy Spirit. We sing that song, Come Holy Spirit, dark is the hour. We need your filling, your love and your mighty power. Some of you will never see the answers to your prayers because you don't crave that Holy Spirit power. Some of you will never be the witness that you need to be to your family because you don't crave that Holy Spirit power. And until we understand that I can do nothing for the cause of Christ on my own, I'll never crave it. But when is the last time that you realize that your marriage will not work unless you have the power from on high? When is the last time that you grasp the fact that you will never be the parent you need to be unless you have the Holy Spirit power upon your life? The decision-making process, it needs the Holy Spirit's power because I can't do it on my own, nor can you. We need this power to pour down on Calvary Baptist Church. Amen. I'm not talking about a weird Pentecostal type idea. I'm talking about the Spirit of God coming down so much like he did on a D.L. Moody. That D.L. Moody, as he walked down Wall Street, had to step into a corridor and say, Lord, would you lift some of it from off of me? But some of us have so much sin built up in our life that the Holy Spirit can't be poured because our vessel is not empty. It's full of everything we want it to be full of. But it's not full of what it needs to be full of. Some of you need to empty yourself tonight. 
This needs to be the heartbeat of every believer, not just the heartbeat of a pastor and a staff. It can't just be the heartbeat of a few. We need to reach those around us. They're our responsibility. Some have pride tonight you need to empty yourself of. You think you're too good to go soul winning? Really? There was a man that came to Christ that said, that said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And you know, the Lord told him several things, and he said, well, I do that. And he said, then go sell all that thou hast. Give it to the poor and come and follow me. And that man, because of pride, turned and walked away from the Savior and may have never trusted Christ because he wouldn't empty himself of pride. You're too good to go soul winning? Let me ask you this question. Are you saved? Because through the scripture, we read of the most powerful person in all the world. You may think you have power, and I may think I have power. And let me help you. We have no power. Save the power given to us from on high. Boy, you think what people, they, they jump when I speak. Yeah, why don't you jump when God speaks? Amen. It's called arrogance. It's called pride. It's called you think that you can do it better than God. You better be careful. Because pride cometh before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. I wonder how many children will go off into a Christless eternity because they never saw Christ in a parent. I wonder how many teenagers will go off into a Christless eternity because they see people saying they're saved but doing their own thing and they say well, I just I'll just do my own thing then some of us need to pour out our selfishness and say Lord would you clean my vessel and would you would you fill me with whatever you want me to be full of because Lord I surrender to you because I myself also am a man I'm no better than the next guy. I'm just a sinner that had to realize that I needed salvation. Do you need salvation tonight? You say, no, I'm already saved. Then why don't we commit tonight to set our arrogance and our pride and our cockiness and our haughtiness aside and say, Lord, use me to do something great for the cause of Christ. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. The prayer, the person, the propagation, and the pouring. You're here tonight, you say, Pastor, if I died this evening, I don't even know for sure that I'm saved. If I died tonight, Pastor, I don't know for sure I'd go to heaven, but Pastor, I'd like to know. Would you slip your hand up all over the lower floor here? Is there anybody like that? You'd slip your hand up. And just say, Pastor, I don't know for sure, but I'd like to. Is there anybody like that? By our testimony on this Sunday night, we're all saved. Would you come use the altar and say, Lord, I, I need to get some things out of my system. I need to get it out of my life because I know it's hindering me from serving you. Maybe tonight you just need to come to God and say, I recognize some pride issues. Lord, would you take them from me that I might be greatly used? I've watched folks, and so have you, who, oh, we rest in our own talent and we end up accomplishing nothing. Father, I pray that you'd bless this invitation. Do a work in our heart. Do a work in our lives and in our church. May souls be the main thing our main focus each and every day of our life. In Jesus' name, as we stand together, Brother Tom Johnson singing, would you come join these many who've already come? Have you longed for sweet peace and for faith to increase? Have you earnestly, fervently prayed? But 
but you cannot have rest or be perfectly blessed until all on the altar is laid. Is your hall on the altar of sacrifice laid? Your heart does the spirit control? You can only be blessed and have sweet, perfect rest as you yield him your body and soul. Would you walk with the Lord in the light of his word and have peace and contentment always. You must do his sweet will to be free from all hill on the altar your hall you must lay. laid your heart does the spirit control you can only be blessed and have peace and sweet rest as you yield him your body and soul oh we never can for that message we heard tonight and we pray that as pastor casts his vision toward the church father that it would become our vision and that we would see that it's not just his vision it's it's our savior's vision it was his commission it was his command and father how powerful it is if we would just get a hold of it just the conversation with the woman at the well where he said all prejudice aside and she couldn't even believe it that he would speak to her and Father, what an example you set for us. And Father, help us to grab hold of that example for 2012 and run with it, run with the banner of the cross. And Father, become faithful witnesses of you and what you've done for us so that others can be partakers of the same. In your name, amen. You may be seated as Brother Jerry leads us in a verse of song. Some books now, turn to 145 if you would. I love to tell the story. right here 
there's your family. Look, wave. There's a camera and everything. Watching you get baptized, and there's your mama right there. I got a message this week that little Autumn came to her mom and said, Mom, I don't, I don't want to go to hell. And her, you and your dad, right, started talking to her about Christ. And little Autumn bowed her head and asked Jesus to save her and is getting baptized on this first day of 2012. And you'll never forget when you got baptized, will you? Are you still looking at all these people? Are you amazed? Yes. Autumn, can you look at me? Have you asked Jesus to save you? Mm -hmm. Yes. Upon your profession of faith, my dear little sister, grab your nose. Grab your nose. I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Bear the lights of his death. Oh, she's cute. It's good to see all of you here tonight. God bless you. Let's stand together. As we stand, we got to set up our school to start on Tuesday. Yeah, had to think that through. Tuesday. So make sure your kids are on time. Offices and staff, nobody will be here tomorrow. Offices are closed. Staff of the church is off tomorrow in observance of New Year's Day. Folks, I love you so very much. Would you make this a matter of prayer every morning? Lord, help me to be able to tell somebody about the Lord. Just, you'd be surprised. He'll bring them by you. You don't have to hunt for them. You'll be able to tell somebody. Just, uh, just this afternoon, I had to stop and get gas on my way home. And as I stopped to get gas, there was a man just yelling at his wife uh, in the car. And I hate when I see that. When he got, I didn't try to break that up, but when he got done yelling, he kind of stormed over and he was standing by the trash can where I was emptying his pockets. And I said, you know what can help a marriage? He said, nothing can help mine. I said, oh yes, what I know can. And he looked at me and he said, what's that? And I took a track out and I turned it over. I said, God can. And he said, well, I don't know if I want to talk. I said, I'm not going to talk to you about God right now. I said, if you take this home, you'd be surprised what God can do. And he got in his car. What do we do? Plant the seed. Just tell somebody about the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't steal people from other Baptist churches. But I'll take them from a Catholic church. I'll take them from a Presbyterian church. I'll take them from, you, you say you will. Yeah, because they're teaching them other ways to heaven. And there's only one way to heaven. And we need to tell them about the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Help us set up the school if you would. Don't forget, it's a surprise for Mrs. Rolfe. So don't go over and say, thank you for watching our kids. We'll see you Saturday. Don't do that stuff. I love you all. Have a great night. You are dismissed.